Welcome to Victory Live, streaming from the campus of Victory Baptist Church in Mount Juliet, Tennessee. We're glad you've joined this week's worship broadcast live on our Facebook page and as well as our website. At the conclusion of the message today, we will give you more information on how to better connect with Victory Baptist. As you prepare for this week's message, grab your Bible and follow along as we join this week's Victory Live broadcast.
so glad you chose to worship with us at Victory Baptist Church. If you are going to Children's Church right now, if you want your children to go to Children's Church, uh, line up over here by our children's pastor, Kyle. And uh, why don't you take about 30 seconds to greet the people around you. Thank you very much. We're glad that you are all here with us this morning. And I know that as we gather this morning, there are a lot of folks that have taken advantage of the schools being out for the next couple of weeks. And we want to be praying for them as they are taking some time to find some recreation and recreation as we see it in the scripture. And we pray God's blessing upon them. I was uh, reminded by the words of that song this morning that we just sang. Uh, Christ is enough, and I, I wonder if that's a question that we should all answer for ourselves. Is Christ enough? There seems to be a lot of discussion today about uh, Jesus and whether Jesus is all that we need and can we trust him to be uh, the only thing necessary for our salvation. 
Um, and that's something that's very important for us. Uh, everything I need is in him. Is that, is that true for us? And I think that's something that's on the minds of a lot of people. Uh, we live in a world that is changing quickly. We see a lot of uh, disillusion, uh, disillusionment. We see a lot of discouragement. Uh, we see a lot of things happening that many of us thought we would never see. But we need to ask ourselves and we need to answer for ourselves the question this morning, is Christ indeed enough for us? Is he all everything that I need? And this was a question back in the first century as well as we turn to Hebrews chapter 4 today. And there were a lot of folks asking that question because they were living with different issues. Uh, they had heard and uh, the gospel had been preached in such a way that uh, the early disciples really believed that Jesus would return uh, before uh, many of them died. And what was happening is there were people who were going through very difficult times. There were people who were not only dying in their faith, but they were dying for their faith. And so there were a lot of questions as to whether or not um, we should really hold on to this teaching that has come to us as a result of Jesus Christ coming and walking and living among us, ultimately dying on a cross for us. And uh, do we really see freedom when we look at the cross? Do we really understand that the cross is our freedom? It's not just freedom that we think about here in, in our country. We've been somewhat, um, uh, we've been blessed, but we've taken it for granted, all the freedoms that we have here in this country. Um, but do we really understand the depth of that statement in the song, in Christ, or when I see the cross, I see freedom? Do we see the ultimate expression of freedom for us to be able to not only live, not only to live with hope and understanding that Christ is our deliverer, our savior, but also Christ is our all in all. He is the ultimate um, victory for us over the penalty of sin, over the power of sin, and even in a real sense, the possession of sin as sin seeks to possess us and to rule our lives. And so he is our freedom. And that comes as a result of what he did for us. And that is at the heart of what the preacher of Hebrews is trying to share with us in these three verses that we're going to look at today. And it's very important that we begin to understand and hold these truths um, very dear to our heart and that we stand on these truths because this is our hope. We cannot place our hope in the things of the world. These are temporary things. These are things that are passing. Things are changing. Just think about uh, the music that was very popular for you just 10 years ago. The people that you were listening to. I was listening to some of the folks in our praise team this morning, and they were talking about some of the Christian bands from the 90s, and I'm going... <laughs> Most people now, they wouldn't even know who you're talking about when you, because the, everything changes. Think of the movie stars and the sports stars that we all call their name, and just at their name, we know who we're talking about. And yet, they're different than the stars were 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So what is it that we have that we can hold on to that really begins to allow us to recognize that our hope is not from this world or not of this world, but it is in this world. And that's something that's very important for each of us to truly understand and to be able to express. So let's look at these uh, three verses today and try and unpack what God has for us here as he reveals an understanding of what Jesus has done for us as a result of who Jesus is. So in verse 14 of chapter 4 of Hebrews, Hear the word of the Lord. It is on the screen. I invite you to follow along as I read aloud. So then, since we have a, a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly, to the throne of our gracious God. 
There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. When we need it most. Let's pause just for a moment and pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today acknowledging that even on our best days, we need your grace and your mercy. And we're grateful for how you continue to express that toward us and offer it to us. We're grateful that Jesus not only opened the door to life that is new and abundant and eternal to us, but he has also opened the door to your throne of grace that we can come with great confidence and approach your throne of grace knowing full well that as a result of who Jesus is and who we are in Jesus, we can approach you with our every need, our every concern, our every fear, our every anxious moment. Lord, help us to claim the promise of your provision. Allow us to stand firmly there. And as we think about all of the needs surrounding us and all of the hurts in the lives of people around us, even the trials within us this day, we pray, Father, that we would look to you and that we would come to you through our great high priest, even the Lord Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's what the preacher of Hebrews wanted us to know, really, about Jesus. And, and as you know, in the first four chapters of Hebrews, the preacher is really trying to uh, lead us to understand the full measure of who Jesus is and help us to recognize that he alone is not only our entrance into the throne of grace of God, but also he is our connection that allows us to become children of God and to be able to have full me the full measure of his blessing and his inheritance at our disposal. And this is something that is very important because we live in a day when we have a tendency of calling on everyone else in our time of need. When we have a concern or something that comes, when we have learned that there's something that's going to be extremely challenging to us in our lives, we have a tendency of picking up the phone and calling someone. You put the name of that person in your own mind right now. Who is that person that you call? What I want to suggest to us today is that the first person that we should be thinking about calling when we receive word or we come to a reality that we're going to be faced with some very challenging things, the first person we, that we need to call is Jesus. Because Jesus is really our high priest. He is the great high priest. He's not just an earthly priest who comes and makes sacrifice for us and enters into the Holy of Holies for us. He entered once for all. And that's something that's very important for all of us to recognize today because when we think about our relationship to the Heavenly Father, it's not Jesus plus our offering of sacrifice. It's not Jesus plus us doing some type of uh, checklist saying that that's going to make us right with God. Only Jesus can make us right with God. And only Jesus can clear the way and the path for us to be able to enter the throne of grace and be able to experience the full measure of that. The writer of Hebrews is helping the people that had a full understanding of the priest purpose uh, from the Old Testament and in the life of the people of Israel. He understood that the priest's purpose was to relate God to the people and to take God to the people. But the priests were also responsible for interceding on behalf of the people to God. And we need to recognize that as we have come to the Father through our great high priest, who is Jesus Christ, who comes to us as Jesus, the Son of God, as in verse 14, you know the name of Jesus. The Hebrew uh, translation of that is Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus in the Greek, which means Jehovah saves. He is our Savior. So he comes not only in human form to walk among us as Jesus, he also comes as the Son of God, the very creator of all of the universe, the one who provided us with the breath of life. He comes to us as one who is able to identify with all of our challenges and one who is able to overcome all of our challenges to see us through those challenges. 
That's why in verse 15, the preacher of Hebrews here says to us that he has been tempted, he has been tried in every way that we have. Uh, the Christian um, Standard Bible translates that he sympathizes with us. He sympathizes with us in that he has experienced it. Maybe a better way for us to think about it in our terms today is that he is able to empathize with us. He not only sympathizes knowing that we are going through something, he has been through all of those things. And you say, well, how does Jesus know what I've experienced? How is it that Jesus is able to say that he can deal with the heartbreak that I'm having right now? Well, the reason for that is because Jesus took on the form of man and came into the world that he created by the way and he walked among us I, I love the translation you've heard me say this before of John chapter 1 where it's revealed that Jesus was incarnated and Eugene Peterson in his translation the message says he became flesh and he moved into the neighborhood he came to walk with us he came to know us he didn't just walk through the neighborhood. He came to deal with us the way that we are to deal with our neighbors. I'm concerned that in the day in which we live, we are so separated from our neighbors even though they live right next to us. Most of us in this room, many of us in this room, may find it very difficult to be able to tell the rest of us anything about our neighbors. Do we know... Do we know how many children live in the, the house across the street from us? Do we know what the first and the last name is of the, the neighbors that live across the street from us? That live next door to us? How, how much time do we spend? And, and I get it. You say, well, Brother Chuck, we're busy. We've got kids of our own. We've got baseball and we've got dance and we've got all the other things that we've got going on. We're busy. We get it. I get it. But there's also the sense in which we need to understand that if we are to express the freedom that we have found in Christ that we sang about this morning through the cross with him being our high priest, then we also need to understand that we can't just simply drive through the neighborhood and think that we're being all that Christ wants us to be in the neighborhood. And that's a hard thing. The same thing is true at school. How many of us spend enough time really getting to know the people that are in our school, in our classes. We have a tendency of categorizing people, you know, when we go to school. Uh, don't associate with them. Associate with these. Hope to associate with these. That's the way we have a tendency of categorizing people. And yet, when we go into the school setting, we recognize that there is a need for us to allow Christ to use us as his instrument there in that setting. And you say, but how, how do I really know that Christ can identify with me in all the struggles that I have? I, I've, I've suffered a lot of brokenness in my life. Well, the scripture says this to us. He restores, he restores those who are brokenhearted. I've been crushed in spirit. My spirit is all gone. The scripture says that he mends those who are crushed in spirit. I feel like I've been abandoned. I feel as though there's no one that really listens, that no one that really cares, no one is really concerned about me. Here's what the scripture says, the book of Psalms. David said, I've been young and I've been old. I've never seen the righteous abandon of God. Do we really believe that? Do we hold on to that? And, and can, I, can I challenge us this morning to think about that when we feel as though we've been abandoned? Is it because I have cut myself off from other people? I've been so consumed with what's going on in my life that I've decided that I need to take care of me and I've cut myself off from the people and it's quite possible that the very person that God has sent to me and sent into my life to minister to me, I've cut off because I've decided that I need to suffer alone. Is that possible? And I'm afraid that what some of us do is we cut off our great high priest as well. 
because we at times reach those places where we're asking, where is God? Where is God? And I think one of the greatest promises in all the Bible, it appears over and over again, is when the scripture says to us that I will never leave nor forsake you. When God spoke to Moses, he promised him that. When he spoke to Joshua, he promised him that. And when Jesus gave us the great commission, he promised us that he would never leave nor forsake us. He would always be with us. And lo, I will be with you always. Do we hold on to that? Do we trust that? Do we believe that? And you say, well, how does Jesus identify with me in the things that I don't want to do? Well, he did, identifies very well with that. Let me take you back just a moment to the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. What was his prayer? As he was earnestly and fervently and with great attention, great energy, praying, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. And therefore, we need to understand that even in those things that we don't want to do, the Lord is with us and he identifies with us. Man, I didn't want to do algebra in school. But I had to do it, right? I'll tell you another little secret. I didn't want to do Hebrew either. But I had to do it. And I'm grateful the Lord was with me especially in that Hebrew stuff. You do know that Hebrews reads backwards, right? I have a hard time reading from left to right, much left, right to left. But there are things that we don't want to do. You know, like forgive someone that has wronged us. Like pray for someone who has wronged us to love our enemies, to go into those places that everyone is warning us about and saying, don't go. Let me just say this quickly about that. If you have a clear sense of God's leadership and God's direction for you to go, will you sing and really mean wherever he leads, I'll go? Do we believe that? Last year, we had a young lady here in our fellowship that was telling us that she was going back to the continent of Africa, listen, to a place where she had been imprisoned for sharing the love of Jesus. She was going back there to, to relate to the people that she had connected with while there, representing Jesus. Her mom and dad were sitting here on the second row, as she stood there and told us all that she was going back to that very place where she had been imprisoned for telling people about Jesus. Sometimes it's not about safety. Sometimes it's about security. My security in Jesus. And this is what the writer is really trying to help us to understand here because what he wants us to see is that we have an entrance, we have an opening, we have a door to the throne of God's grace. And we have a Savior who is able to identify with all of our fears and he is able to identify with all the things that don't seem to make sense in our lives. Jesus on the cross, looking down at the very men who nailed him to that piece of wood and cried out to the Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they do. How many times in your life and in my life have we come to realize after we had cut someone off, after we had written them off, because we didn't understand them, we didn't like what they were doing, we didn't like the way they were dressed, we didn't like the things they, they were a part of. And then a little bit later on, God opened our eyes 
and other things were revealed about them and we began to see them in a different light. We began to see them like Jesus sees us. Because Jesus never looked at me for how I am. He always looked at me for who I would become in him. And that's the whole idea of what we are being taught here in these few verses about a high priest, a great high priest, who doesn't judge us for where we are or what we are, but he loves us for what we will be in him and what we will become as a result of his transforming power in our lives. And that's why he came to live here, so that he could say to us and so that we could believe that he does understand when we are broken in spirit, when we are hurting, and when we are angry, and when we are afraid. He does understand those things. He understands even what it means to feel far away from God. You say, when is that? That was at that moment just before he died on the cross. Because of my sin, in that moment, he was separated from the Father. Why have you forsaken me? Sin forsaken. Why? Because he took my sin, not his sin, my sin upon him. And in doing so, when I look at the cross, I see freedom. I love that next line in that song that says, when I see the grave, I'll see Jesus. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, I'll do a funeral service in this very room. And what I will say to everyone who gathers here is that Miss Mary took her last breath. I was in the room with her when she took her last breath on Thursday morning. And in that moment, in that moment, she was with Jesus. That's because of who Jesus is. That's our hope. And our hope is based on the fact that Jesus is our great high priest. He entered the Holy of Holies. He offered the sacrifice, not the blood of bulls, not the blood of lamb. He offered himself for us. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that through him we might become the righteousness of God. Peter puts it this way when he says to us that the righteous died for the unrighteous. Wow. So that we would have entrance into the throne of grace I love the promise that the Bible provides us in Romans chapter 8 when it says there is nothing 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 in this world or any other world that will ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus not my fear not my discouragement not my dismay nothing can separate me from the love of God. And now, because of Jesus and all that he has accomplished for me, now I have opportunity to come before the Father and with great confidence, because I share a name with Jesus, I share an inheritance with Jesus, I'm able to approach the throne of grace and say, Heavenly Father, I'm afraid. Heavenly Father, I'm anxious. Heavenly Father, I'm discouraged. 
Heavenly Father, I don't understand. Heavenly Father, why is this happening? And there the mercy of God is extended to us. And there the grace of God embraces us and ministers to us. Applied to our life, His grace that is more than sufficient for all of our needs. And as a result, we now have become priest. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And he goes on to say that we've been sent into the world to be the representatives of God as priests. Doing what? Taking God to the people and taking the needs of the people to God as we intercede for them. So that which we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that Jesus is Lord over all, we bring with us, we bring it to the throne of grace and we call out to the Heavenly Father and we've discovered that He is listening, that He is aware, that He is attentive to our needs. And he ministers to us. What a glorious promise, a glorious truth that we must embrace in this day in which we live. How often do we approach the throne of grace with, with confidence and boldly saying, Lord, here's my need. What do you have to offer me in grace? Lord, I need your grace just now. I need your mercy just now. He is our great high priest. And as our great high priest, he's now sending us as his priest, marching under his banner, sharing his love, his grace, and his mercy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, for all that you provide us and all the wonderful things that come to us as a result of your gift in Jesus, we give you praise. And we pray now, Father, that you would speak into our hearts truth that will guide and direct us, that will allow us to walk in the truth that is discovered in your word and the promise that we have seen there. There's never been a time when we've needed the direction of a great high priest more than right now. Father, give us the courage to trust you. Give us the conviction to go in your name. And Father, may we walk in your commission to share with all people. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray today. Amen. Let's stand together. And maybe this morning the Lord has ministered to you, maybe shared something with you, brought you to a place where you're wanting to connect with him through faith and trust in the great high priest who is Jesus the Lord. Or maybe this morning the Lord has ministered to you and would call you to the altar just to simply kneel here and to allow the Lord to address your needs as you pray for yourself. Maybe this morning there's a prayer need that you would want to share with Mike or myself this morning. Maybe today you would want to unite with this fellowship. We invite you, we encourage you to come in the direction of the Lord this morning. As we sing, you come just now. We hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of Victory Live. This is your personal invitation to visit us next week for worship on the Victory Baptist campus. To find weekly worship schedules, upcoming events, or to learn about better connecting with Victory Baptist, please visit vbcmtj.org. 
Our prayer is that the live broadcast of this week's worship gathering has helped you to grow in your walk with Christ. And again, thanks for joining us today for Victory Live.